Jack came from. And uh, you may all know, know about her because of the work she's done with Kiva, uh, her being a wife of Raza Aslan, and many more things that she's done. But what's really incredible about her is, is who she is and where she comes from, her mindset, the love that she brings into what she does. And we're going to talk a lot about that. A lot of you are familiar with Kiva, or Kiva, and she'll tell us how to pronounce it properly. Yeah, yeah, Kiva. Kiva. Say, uh, your own. Say yeah. it however you wish. <laughs> which, you know, uh, which is one of the most transformative social impact ventures uh, ever. And it's, it's the use of technology to really democratize capital in a way that's never been done before. And I'm going to hand it over to her to talk more about her. Uh, <coughs> Like you said, where she comes from, her thought process, what inspired her to truly deal with these issues of poverty, and to use entrepreneurship in such a powerful way to really create a game changer. So with that note, I hand it all over to Erin, Jessica, Erin Jack. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's funny, we are old friends and it, it's really nice just to be sitting here in, in a conversational way, not just with my friend here, but with all of you. So in short, I'm happy to tell you sort of how uh, Kiva came about. I'll fast forward through 25 years of my life. So I grew up in um, the Midwest, the United States, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I grew up in a Christian family, a Christian home. And there were a lot of values that I learned from a young age about service and about doing your best to help, to use very simple language. Um, and I didn't know what that meant for me, but I got this idea over the years that it, I should go work with nonprofits. I thought that was the thing. I thought they were the helpers because they, weren't, they were giving and they weren't taking. I had a very simplistic view of business and the world, and I thought, business must be bad because they take, they take money from, from people. I mean, they sell you things, it's great. But I just had this idea, business was bad, there was a trick there. Nonprofits were good, they were giving, that they were, they were the team I wanted to be on. So fast forward a bunch. I studied philosophy and poetry in school, not, not business. Again, I thought business was a little sketchy. And in fact, entrepreneurs were the worst, I thought. They were the gang leaders starting businesses, so I really better steer clear of those guys. So I graduate with not much of a strong vision for what I wanted to do, except find a great nonprofit and everything would be fine. Well, I, I didn't quite do that first off. I, on a whim, moved to California from Pennsylvania and I got a temp job as an administrative assistant at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And I feared for my soul because I thought I was in the lion's den. Um, I thought I was sleeping with the enemy, it was terrible. So I, I, go, I would go to work every day very suspicious and in fact, seriously, I feared so much, as a funny sidebar, I feared so much that I was in with kind of the wrong crowd at Stanford Business School that I got a second job at night. I would go, um, come back from my like, work there, and I, would, I lived as a house mom in a home for teen moms, and I managed these wonderful um, handful of teenagers and their babies, and I would make sure everyone got dinner and did their chores and did their homework and got to bed, and then the next morning I'd drop some off at the bus stop and the Kid the babies off at daycare, I had like a bunch of car seats in my little Honda Civic hatchback. And then I'd go to my other work, which I knew that was good work. I wasn't so sure what would happen to business school. Of course, it sounds a little ridiculous now, but I learned that actually there were ways to use business and entrepreneurial thinking for good in the world and to address some of the social problems and issues that I cared about. And so I stuck around at that job actually for three years. And in fact, I got to work right in the heart of the Center for Social Innovation. So the place where people were trying to address those kinds of issues that I cared about so much. Well, one day I stay late after work because there's this guy, Dr. Muhammad Yunus, coming to speak. It was the fall of 03, three years before Dr. Yunus and his Grameen Bank would win the Nobel Peace Prize for their pioneering work in modern microfinance. I just thought he sounded like an interesting guy. The, the, the email blast that went out on campus called him this banker to the poor. Sounded interesting, a little eyebrow raising. So I, I went and I learned about microfinance and it was, um, it, was, it was sort of one of these rare, wonderful aha moments in my life. 
I quit my job at Stanford. I'm, I moved to East Africa. I'm telling you, it was a really good talk. Um, I wanted to learn more. So uh, I would learn later in business school that I am very risk tolerant. Who knew? But it seemed like not a big deal to me. I'd quit my job, move to East Africa, bank my way into another job. That's it. I'm very good at that, not to brag, begging my way into unpaid internships and stuff. But I, I worked for a few months with an organization doing microenterprise development there. They're called Village Enterprise. And started to see how a tiny bit of capital could change the lives of hardworking entrepreneurs doing very, very small business activities. And I started to ask some very simple what if questions. You know, what if I could stay in touch with these individuals that I was meeting there doing my work for Village Enterprise? We're talking, you know, goat herders, seamstresses, uh, farmers, very small kiosk owners, uh, people doing very simple things. What if I could stay in touch with these new friends? What if instead of this traditional um, kind of old school way of interacting, somebody who wants to be helpful as a donor and somebody who is in need of something being the beneficiary, what if we could change that role a little bit? Because it can get weird and it is not always the best fit and not always the best way to solve problems. What if we could change that to a relationship of equals and have a lender and a borrower? Um, wouldn't that be interesting? What if we could use technology to make more of that happen? So very naively, I asked and tried to answer some of these questions and did a small experiment along with my co-founder, Matt, in the fall of, gosh, in the spring of 04. <laughs> no, 05, the spring of 05, we did a pilot round of loans um, with seven entrepreneurs in Uganda. They needed about 3,000 bucks, and so we begged friends and family who overnight gave us the money that those individuals needed. We sent it over to Uganda and we waited and hoped. And six months later, all the, these seven entrepreneurs had been repaid, and we decided that that proved something. We weren't sure what. So we launched Kiva, and they decided it was a real thing in the fall of 05. And that first year, after the $3,000 pilot round of loans, that, that first year we facilitated 500,000 in loans. The second year it went up to 15 million. The next year, 40. The next year, 100. Kiva crossed a billion dollars this last year in loans in these little $25 bits from the Yay, lenders. <laughs> um, so they grew in, in this crazy way, and it's been a wonderful and sort of surreal thing to watch. Um, the loans, just to be clear, I feel like I'm feeling it out. I feel like this is a, a group of people that wants to know the details. So simply put, uh, the loan, it works this way. So you have lenders and borrowers. And in between those lenders and borrowers, you have Kiva itself, um, the entity, that finds and works with these partners in the field, microfinance institutions and lending organizations of all different types at this point. $25 or 50 or 100, whatever the lender chooses, comes from the lender. Kiva doesn't touch it, goes through Kiva, goes through the microfinance institution, they don't touch it, and into the hands of the borrower specified by that lender. Over time, the borrower repays. 98 plus percent of the time, they do repay in full. They do repay with interest. And, some of, and that interest, all of the interest actually, is kept by the field partner, by the organization that's distributed the loan. And then just the principal comes back through Kiva and back into the hands of lenders. So that's how it works. Um, I'll pause and see what else. I, 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 we were joking. I, I can talk, so I'm going to make myself pause and see where else we'd like to go next. <laughs> so what is so revolutionary about what you've done? And why do you think this is a model which you know, can scale and yeah. have a huge impact? So it's funny. Um, it's only been um, 13 years since the founding, uh, not, not quite, 12 and a half. And to say now what was revolutionary then, it feels like a little bit funny. It feels uh, it, it's kind of a, a, a time warp because back at the time, Nobody was using the word crowdfunding. It wasn't a thing. It wasn't a term. I wasn't saying that. That wasn't in our pitch, you know, our pitches to our first donors um, to support us. Because Kiva is a 501c3, and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, so that was a revolutionary thing at the time. We were the first to do that and put it online. The, the other peer-to-peer -peer lender, one of the earliest, that started, in fact, in the same week, in, in October in October 2005, is Prosper.com, and they were doing peer-to-peer, person-to-person lending for profit. But we were the first, we were among the first to do that. So that, that itself was uh, revolutionary. Secondly, no one had done anything with 0% um, loans like that. So it was very confusing for all the regulatory um, people. Uh, the SEC, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, did not regulate it. Department of State, Department of Corporations, state to state didn't regulate it. It wasn't a tax deductible 
donation, so it wasn't regulated that way. So nobody knew what to do with this thing. And again, being risk tolerant, apparently, we just decided to do it anyway and hope that no one would get mad or arrest us and just see what happened. And by the time a lot of the law actually caught up and made their official statements and memos and all those things that they do, we had already grown and were working in several countries and sort of got grandfathered in. And so that was, we weren't cavalier about it, I'm saying it quickly today, but we did as much homework and research as we could, but it just hadn't been done before. So that was a new thing at the time. I think also, and, and there's lots of little pieces, but I think one of the other big ones back in 2005, you really couldn't get that direct connection very easily with, let's say, a goat herder, an illiterate goat herder uh, living in a, you know, off the grid in the middle of Uganda. Like, how did you, re how would you reach that person? Well, this was a way to do it that hadn't been done before. So, we laughed because I remember the early, in the early days, the, the first few team members, uh, we'd sort of look at our, look, look at each other and say, is this one of the first bloggers in this? Half of the country, I think so. <laughs> As we would get updates from entrepreneurs, so there are those three things. But but the th what what I what you can't know at the beginning of a new idea is what will and won't work. You make your assumptions, you make your bets, you you you, you hope, <laughs> and then you just jump and try it out and learn as you go. What we didn't anticipate was how sticky the loan would be for connectivity. I, we thought it was a great statement of equality and partnership and and would promote this kind of interaction that would be better for the world in certain circumstances than a traditional donor-beneficiary relationship. Um, we thought there would be beneficial things about it, and of course, keep it in an event, did not invent microfinance, that was already happening, and there wasn't a way to get involved in it, besides, again, this sort of disjointed way of writing a check and donating to an organization doing that, but then watching the loans happen. So there wasn't a way to match that up, but we, we had no idea how nice it would be for the typical lender to have not just information coming back about the impact of their dollars, but actually information as, as uh, sorry, not just information, but also a few dollars at a time, say, coming back saying, yes, not only did this $25 get received by this person, but now here's what they're doing, and here's $2 back, here's $3 back. That was a very powerful tool to keep people engaged. Um, and I think you could have pretty much the exact same experience um, with a donation except for the money coming back, and it just changes people. People listen up a little bit differently when it's their doll, when it's their money coming back in a little bit. So there was there was so much we didn't know, and despite what we knew, and because of what we knew, it's a big mix, right, of luck and happened to get it right. Uh, it, it it worked. So let me just uh, expand the conversation, right? Pakistan uh, is a country which has gone uh, got independence about seventy years ago. We are still tackling with poverty. 30% of the population is below the poverty line. And about 80% of the population is poor or vulnerable. And you know, poverty is really debilitating. It, it, it takes away a lot of your humanity. And this is something that we need to tackle as a nation. But when we start, I've been in social impact venture, venture space. I work for Acumen. So I have an understanding of the space. And when I took this job at the government, as the Board of Investment, uh, yeah, I, I made it clear that one of my agenda items is to really not only bring investment to large industries, but to really bring about a dramatic change in the way we use capital to change lives. And the vision of Pakistan is to create a society where every human being in this country, every citizen can live up to his or her potential. Right? It doesn't have to be a certain GDP number or a middle income or upper income country. It is really a society where everybody can live up to their potential. And to make this happen in, in our work, we're finding out one of the big challenges is capital. So Ke what Kiva did was truly transformative. It made capital accessible to people who just never had access to capital. So I would like to hear more about that. But the other thing we found out, which, 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 which is a source of poverty, is people's level of confidence or a sense of empowerment, right? When, when, you, when you talk to the poor, it's not a lack of resources which is what what really keeps them poor is a sense of disempowerment that society has created around them. What I found interesting with the Kiva model was that it really brought together the lender and the borrower in a very in, in, a, in a partnership like relationship where they got to know each other and build and, and, and actually uh, instead of a money lender giving you money 
it's somebody and and, uh, and, 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 and and having power over you, right? Is an equitable relationship, and the new kind of dynamic was created. What is your thinking about that? How can we, how can a country like Pakistan really think about dramatically leapfrogging this this challenge, right? Where we, how do we bring? Because you know, Pakistan is under a lot of pressure right now. We have a very strong relationship with China. Right? Everybody is giving the China example as a country which has brought millions or hundreds of millions of people people out of poverty very rapidly. Is that the model or is there a new model that's emerging in this new world order driven by a technology revolution which empowers the human being in a very different sort of way? Can we talk about that? Yeah. What's your vision? What's your thought process around that? And what would be a really powerful uh, thought that we can, in, in Pakistan, sure. build upon? Sure. And before I answer, I just want to say, how lucky am I to get to talk to you of all people about this. I mean, I really, I, I, might, I may jujitsu this and turn it around and have you share all the wisdom and experience that, that you have. So I'm very humbled to be up here with you. Um, so I have sort of my touchy-feely answer, which is always my favorite kind of answer, the, the squishy, lovey answer that I'll talk about. But also, sure, there are, there are some hard and fast examples that we can, we can look to and talk about, um, China and elsewhere. So the, the, on the former, I mean, I, I've been here for a little over 24 hours, <laughs> 36 hours, and so it would be ridiculous for me to come in and say, here's what you should do, or here's what you need. But from the very little bit that I have observed so far, it's been so, it's been so wonderful to just start to get a taste of the culture here, and it's from what I see, from what I understand, community, family, it's a really big deal. It's, it's a priority, it's sacred, it's, it's, it's a strength that um, is, does not exist everywhere. And so to look at that as one of many qualities or aspects to culture here, I, uh, to look at that as a strength and how, how would you use it, how do you work with that? I mean, I, I tend to believe that relationships can cure all or the, or the solution to so many things. I really genuinely believe that, connecting with one another. And so, yes, there was some, something special that Kiva did with that kind of connection. I, I think about what it takes for people to have hope to believe that they can do something more for themselves or their families and utilize resources, whether they are few or many at any given point in time, but to really believe that it's possible to use whatever you have in front of you to do something better and to lift up not just yourself, but the people around you. I think that the raw material, I think that the foundation, I guess, is here in a way that I, I haven't seen um, elsewhere. It's pretty kind of magical. To, to kind of transition to a slightly more um, I don't know, academic or uh, strategic answer. So as somebody who really came into studying entrepreneurship, studying business later after Kiva had begun, I ended up going back and getting my MBA at Stanford to kind of figure out the language of business. That's how I talked about it. That's what I really believed. Sure, I needed to use, you know, learn how to use spreadsheets and stuff. That would be great too. But I mostly felt like I continued to be in these interactions, again, back to relationships, these meetings, these conversations, where I wanted to be fluent in the language of business, of enterprise, of entrepreneurship. So, I, I um, as a student, I, I learned lots of different sort of definitions of things, and my favorite definition of entrepreneurship in particular, uh, which I also tend to believe that I, is almost, almost a religious, almost a, a, a religious kind of practice. I mean, I, I believe that there's so much there that can be redemptive and inspiring to people. To my, certainly to myself and I think to lots of others. My favorite definition that I come back to a lot is Howard Stevenson's definition. He's a Harvard Business School guy. guy. Um, what's his title? Harvard Business School guy. Anyway, he says that entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. there's so many ties. We talked about letting go and meditation, right? Without regard. So, the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. Now to a person who spent a lot of the last decade providing resources to entrepreneurs, that, that can be a little jarring. Like why, why do I like this definition and what does it mean? To me, it's about a focus on this movement, okay? Taking steps toward an opportunity that you see. Opportunity is sort of a, a, um, a beautiful idea. It's, 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 a, it's about something invisible, something kind of imaginary. I've talked to fellow entrepreneurs at points, and we talk about how we might seem crazy to people because for all, uh, the very uh, beginning of things, you're sort of sitting around like 
in a world of make-believe <laughs> in your head about something you think can happen in the future. And it's invisible, and it's just up here, and nobody else sees it. And then a lot of those first weeks and months, it's a process of making something invisible and strange and just inside of your, you real to other people. This last part, okay, pursuit, right, this movement is about what you can do um, to move ahead. Pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. Put that all together, it's about the pursuit, not the possession of anything. Um, it's about the pursuit, not your position, not the power that you have, um, not your influence, um, not the past, not what you've done and what you can put on your resume or your CV. It's about no matter what today looks like, no matter what you feel confident about or not, no matter if you know one day you'll feel too young to start doing something, you don't have the right experience, and the next day you blink and maybe you feel too old. There's always something every day at any point in life. The great entrepreneurs, people who live and breathe in this entrepreneurial way, this hopeful sort of life-giving way that I love so much, they focus on taking a step or 10 steps, moving forward all the time toward this opportunity that they want to make real in the world and, their, and in their own lives and then people around them, in the lives of the people around them. The resources part is important and can certainly speed those steps along and, and empower people. But again and again, I've seen, you know, you're, if, if that's the mentality of a person, I always have to wait for this thing to be right, for this resource to be in my hand. I, they, they're not gonna get there. It's the people that say, I'm gonna keep moving forward anyway, that do. Now, all that said, what does it look like to be an entrepreneur, let's say here, right here in Pakistan, and want to have, you have a vision, you have an idea, you, you see an opportunity that you want to go make, you know, take advantage of, you want to make something real in the world, of course, think through what it looks like to take those steps and what you might need, what you think you might need to move forward. But then, I would really challenge all of us to um, kind of push ourselves to, to, you know, let's say you, you think you need to hire this person to do X, Y, Z. What happens if you can't pay that person? What happens if, um, you know, scenario plan a little bit. What happens if uh, you can't find that right fit by the date that you need that person to start? Think about the other ways that you can keep moving forward, whether it's going, you know, around or over or through those, those obstacles. I think there's an opportunity for uh, a lot of folks right now, whether it's early stage startups, whether it's mid-stage, whatever, to leapfrog the traditional structures and not, not wait around for, let's say, venture capital to catch up to a place. It, it will, it's coming, it's here already, obviously, and it's gonna continue to grow and accelerate, in fact. But there's such an opportunity to be connected across borders, you know, be, because of crowdfunding. It's not the end all be all, it's not, it doesn't always work for everybody, but there are ways to reach out to whoever it is that you need um, to get those things that you know will help you move a little more quickly. So it's kind of vague, but uh, I, what I don't want to do is come in and say this is the only way. This is the way that you should go. You know, build this sector, build these, build these institutions. There are so many wonderful ideas out there, but my gut says that there will be even more innovative and more uh, tailored solutions that you all can build based on the depth of understanding you have of where you are and who, who you are and who you want to serve. So it's great to get inspiration elsewhere, but I, I, I don't think it's wise or, or that effective to rely on doing it exactly the way somebody else, another person, another organization, another country did it. A lot of times in the very, very beginning of Kiva, we'd have, I mean, a bunch of notable startups, which I probably shouldn't like shame by naming them, but other, I'll say one of the top three crowdfunding platforms today, not in the nonprofit sector even, came to us and said, can we, use your technology, but they didn't want to do loans, they didn't want to work in the developing world, they didn't, what we had built was so specific to exactly what we wanted to do. And we said, no, you should go build exactly the thing that you need for what you want to do. So I'd say, be confident as you look for solutions, get inspiration, get ideas, but then be confident that you might see something new and true today that wasn't the case yesterday and that works here and it doesn't work anywhere else, but we'll, we'll work here, and then who knows, maybe you can scale even way beyond Pakistan and be, be the better thing um, that the world needs. That's amazing. And again, the example she gives is Dr. Yunus, right, and social entrepreneur, who really built, out of Bangladesh, a movement which has, which has actually 
affected at least a billion people around the world, uh, including Pakistan. And uh, yeah, it's all possible. So it doesn't matter where you are. Pakistan's challenges, right, where half the kids are not in school, mm. where um, you know, healthcare, access to healthcare is a huge challenge, access to energy is a huge challenge, um, and access to finance is a huge challenge. You know, can we leapfrog through technology and through entrepreneurs who are trying to solve these problems? What, uh, in terms of entrepreneurs, right, the, the social entrepreneurial space in Pakistan is not well developed. There aren't too many role models. The role models in society are mostly politicians or athletes, and there are no real entrepreneurial role models. You are one of them, right? You are somebody who who uh, exemplifies what is possible. Um, do you want to talk more about that and, and, and sure. how you know it, 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 sure. when there is when social, especially social entrepreneurs. Forget about entrepreneurs. Sure. No major entrepreneurial success story either, right? Uh, till now, capital, uh, you know. Those who had capital had power and was sort of, you know, went within the family or a network of friends or community. And even access to capital wasn't democratized, wasn't accessible to everyone. In this new world order, there is a major sh shift that's happened. Yes. Do you yeah. want to talk about? Sure. I mean, I, I would like to think, I believe, that he or she with the best idea and then the best execution is the one who will win. It's not the old way of moving through the world and building things. I, I, as I, as I hinted at, I used to have this incorrect idea that business was bad, nonprofits were good. Uh, nonprofits were the only way to move things forward in a in a positive manner and to have a social impact. I'm very, I'm agnostic at this stage. I have been for quite a while about what structure is best. It's just a vehicle to go do something in the world, and it requires, you know, there's different responsibilities, different liabilities, different um, ways of attracting capital with each different. Way. Potent, different possibilities for scale. But what's funny is, as I also spoke of a little bit, the language is the most, the thing that's the most different between the two um, sectors. And it's not just two ways. There's so many different hybrid organizations, um, different structures that you can build to create a social enterprise that has the best of all worlds. You know, a profitable uh, organization, if it's a for-profit, it's called profitable. And if it's a nonprofit, it's called sustainable, but it's the same thing. It's the same concept. You have an organization that is a little machine doing its thing and, and feeding itself. So um, I think if, if we talk about, you're talking about role models and this idea of becoming a social entrepreneur, my best advice is, sure, again, look around for people and organizations that inspire you. And there, there are more and more and more all, all the time that you uh, of stories that you can read, organizations whose histories you can you can re review from minute one of the inspiration of the idea and to see different paths. But the only thing I can guarantee you is your path will be different. Your path will be your own. And to really feel comfortable in your own skin about that, feel feel confident that you'll probably face similar challenges at certain points, but then you'll face totally new ones that nobody's done before and nobody has the answers to, and it'll be okay. You'll be able to figure those out. So I would say look for role models, get get inspired, but at the end of the day, figure out, clarify, and be as, as specific as you can about what you want to change, what you want to do. And the, the way that I love most to think about it is who you want to serve. I, 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 there's um, Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. I think start with who. Think who do you want to serve, and get to know that person, that demographic, <laughs> that group of people as as deeply as you can before you jump in and try to fix stuff. Uh, it'll be better uh, if you do, and then design very carefully uh, something that you believe works for that person or that group of people. And then from there, sure, find the vehicle that makes sense. Um, it's just a tax structure, though. You know, whatever you choose, it's a tax code, not a religion, <laughs> as I have said before. And then you can you can figure out with that vehicle that you've chosen how to move along and rally the people and, and the resources that you need to get it done. Is that helpful? Does that yeah, be, to very helpful. But one of the key things about you is your love for life, right? And you followed your heart yeah. throughout. Uh, you you broken molds, you went to Africa, you, you went you went to business school, which is also breaking yeah. a mold for you. For right? me. <laughs> and you married Raza Aslan, right? That was the uh, craziest one. <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> and, uh, no, so you've been it bored. actually was very crazy for my like all white, you know, suburban, all Christian neighborhood where I grew up. We go when we go back 
Uh, it's funny. It's um, it's an interesting. That's another conversation. Sorry, I'm interrupting you, but it's a fun one. No, but all the ones who break free, the ones who bring about change, are the ones who follow their heart, right? Do you want to talk about that? How do you really believe in yourself to that yeah. level? <laughs> and and, all, and all, you know, how do you do it? Gosh, I don't think I've ever been asked that. Certainly not on that stage in front of people. Um, but I love it. Well, I think. I do remember this moment, I've been thought about this for a while. I remember this moment in business school where a professor started talking about, um, well, there was actually there was a class called Data and Decisions, and I remember thinking, well, fine, but what do two things have to do with each other? <laughs> because I thought, you decide based on your heart, based on, I mean, data's great, but what does it have to do with the choices you make? <laughs> I'm kidding. But I remember thinking that, like, I noticed that, and I thought, okay, that's, that's one way, I mean, so it, for me, it, it seems like it has been a default. And the only place I can trace that back to in terms of first why that, that is how it is for me is I feel like I have been just immersed in a loving, wonderful family and loving relationships. And you know, quite frankly, I've always felt so deeply connected to God and I have felt empowered by this um, sense of everything's always okay. <laughs> and so again, there, it, not, when I have thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to go have this adventure, quit my job and move somewhere? I've always felt, whether it's rational or not, or naive or not, I've always felt like things are going to be okay. And so taking on risks, I just never even used that language before. I didn't know that that's what, what I was doing. Um, the data. I, had, I, didn't, I didn't know that, that that's what that was. Um, I guess in terms of how you do that, for me, I, I like to think through sort of you know, I think we all maybe do this, but best case, worst case. I guess I do a little cost-benefit analysis, but maybe not in the metrics that uh, um, other people might. My metrics are more about, and I, I've designed them, or I, 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 I've, I've thought about this so much, and I, uh, I've only talked about it a little bit, but I think there are lots of different currencies in, in the world, and there are lots of ways to kind of get paid and, and find satisfaction and find joy Absolutely, there's there's a there are the numbers, and there's data, and there's salaries or whatever, um, you know, the, the actual compensation packages you might get from taking a certain job or pursuing a certain path. But I have felt like the the truer um, the priorities for me have been, you know, I want to get paid in, I want to be able to show up for something every day and spend my waking hours of my existence on this planet doing something that I believe in. That matters to me. I don't know what that currency is. And uh, maybe like a feeling of integrity or integration of what I believe and living that stuff out every day. Um, and you know, figuring out what you really believe and what you really think takes some reflection, which is so hard to do, I, I, first of all, as an adult, as a parent. And I just think in today's fast paced world, it's hard, but it's so important, whether it's through meditation or yoga or prayer or just journaling or whatever, but to reflect and really know yourself and know what you value is hard. But once you do, to line that up every day with what you're working on, what you're spending your talents and your time on, for me has been a priority. There are also silly things like, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, a pretty easy sell. If, if I get to go on an adventure to a new country, count me in. Uh, that's another currency I love. I love working with people that are amazing um, and who are also kind of living out what they believe and, and, and think impact and uh, culture should, you know, working on like culture shifting, potentially very disruptive things, you know, you, you go big or go home, big bets. I love that stuff and so I want to work with people who love that stuff too. So I feel like I've gotten to choose, I've been so lucky to have um, options in front of me or to create options for myself that allow me to get paid in the things that matter a lot more to me than getting a paycheck from somebody and getting paid monetarily. I, the other currencies have been important to me as well. So maybe that's a one little trick, one strategy to following your heart and making decisions based on the other stuff, not just um, what the world might tell you you should do. Any answers? That's good. You can boo, you can cheer, and then I'll know how I'm doing. <laughs> In a word that's really, you know, that's polarized at this point between the rich and the poor, between different faiths, you've talked about both these worlds, right? Yes. And 
how do we do it better as a world? And Pakistan is, again, in the midst of uh, that scenario uh, with <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> oh, there's no problem. You need to make me miss my kids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, how do we do it better? How do we? How how have you been able to bridge these worlds and, uh, and with your relationship with Raja? Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, marriage advice. No, no. I mean, the, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. So I actually, for once, I'm going to have a short answer, but then you can tell me if you want to talk more about it. So my, my super short answer is very clear. Rev and I discovered early on that despite our different faith traditions and backgrounds and experiences in life, we shared the same values, and that was our common ground. And we were actually living out those values in ways that we could each see and understand and, and admired. And that was, I mean, that was that. Was that. And that, that felt much more important to us than sharing the same religion, than sharing the same stories that were resonant to us, and by the way, we've learned each other's. It's not like out of a disrespectful place, it's out of a place of curiosity and, and an understanding that the world's a big place, and there are lots of different ways that you can be given um, ideas and doctrine and, and things to inspire you for the first few decades of your life, and that you can't change that. The songs that you heard growing up for years and years are the songs. I have my, my hymns that I love and are dear to me, and so values, are the same, and and we actually got to give a TEDx talk recently on this topic, which was so fun. And that, another thing that we talked about was that while our marriage in particular is interfaith, all marriages are interbelief. Just because we happen to have two different religious uh, identities and associations, does not mean we're the only two people on the planet who have come together bringing different ideas and opinions and stuff, and having to reconcile those. I mean, ask anybody who's married; they're you, they're not. You don't have two same people out there. So I think it's just a different, I got a different kind of language for reconciling a difference. It's just one kind of difference. So that's how we've looked at it. That was a shorter answer. Yes, what's that? That was a shorter answer. That, I know, thank you. See, you're calling me on it. That was my short answer. <laughs> awesome. We've opened up for questions now. Sure. Um, can you we can have a microphone? Oh, we do have a microphone. Journey of growth. When you are ready, when you are called, 
you are willing and able to make those. And, and, and so there's no, no environment uh, that's conducive or not conducive. It's, it's just where people are, what is driving them, what, is, what are they willing to change. You know, um, I, I think what really drives entrepreneurship is is in her calling. And I think what, what we just heard from her is that she had a, a, a calling that made her do what she did. And when you speak to entrepreneurs, it's always that case. It's, it's, it's who are you, you know, whose life you want to improve? What do you want to do with it? How do you want to bring about a change? I did something you know, many years ago. I, I used to live in Silicon Valley and I packed up my bags and came back to Pakistan to teach meditation because I really felt that I want to come back and, 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 and share this technology with you know with everyone. So I, I sacrificed, I used to drive a BMW, I came back to Pakistan, I was on a bus, and Pakistani buses are <laughs> not as easy to uh, uh, work with. But it was, for me it was important, it was my calling, and I just had to follow my heart. Uh, and that's why I think entrepreneurs also have a lot of heart, right? That's, uh, when we talk about heart, we mean we love something more than ourselves. We love an idea that inspires us to take action, which, which takes us beyond our, um, uh, our attachments. So your family, when you dropped everything and decided to move back, how was your, how was your family? So I didn't have a family at that time, I was single, but at the same time, I, you know, family expectations. <coughs> I come from a traditional family where my parents expected me to me, me be a certain way, right? Um, and, 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 and it was very difficult for a while. Uh, and it took, and actually, you know, I did that for a year and a half, and then I had to go back and work because the pull was just very difficult. But you know, then you, you grow in this journey, right? I decided that I wanted to follow this path. It is an inner calling, right? It's this word called fakiri, right? That you you choose to be, be detached as a mindset, right? Be in the world at the same time, be detached. Be free from it, and that gives you a different strength, a different kind of capacity to follow your heart, and you do it with skill, right? It doesn't have to be just you know, uh, disruptive. You can take people along with you and do it very skillfully. I think, um, I'm like, can we call my mom? What time is it there? She'll tell you how to. You know, it, I, I definitely feel like. I was able to take some small steps and then some big steps, mostly through coming back and reassuring my family of what was remaining unchanged while other parts might be changing. And also not to, you know, as you grow up, I mean, my kids better ask me for permission to do things, but you know, you start to realize you don't have to ask for permission. It's not, it's not theirs necessarily to give and it's not, you get to make your own choices and say, this is who I am and kind of meet yourself where you are, and then meet them where they are, and say, I understand you know, that you might be feeling this way, um, you might be worried about this and this and this, what, makes you feel, what would make you comfortable, then? let's talk about it. But at the end of the day, coming back to it, sort of like the, the answer to the other question about, we have shared, here's what's the same, and here's what's different, we share these values, and isn't it interesting, there are these other pieces that are, that are unique to each of us. I think as you take different steps, take different risks, you can, reassure people and talk them through what this means, like what 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 will what will shift and what won't. And usually they're okay. <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, first of all I would like to I mean you are a living inspiration. Literally yeah. listening to you give give very positive vibes. Thank you. And um, but, but what I want to ask actually that living a life of an entrepreneur, living a life as an entrepreneur <laughs> I personally think, I mean, and from your story, somehow it, it also seems it, uh, it gives that type of voice that you have this fulfilled life. Like, I mean, you had a wonderful relationship, you had a wonderful family all around you, and then you were filled from inside, and you were get you were ready for you know giving something outside, right, to give to this world. Question is, like, can it happen to someone who is not fulfilling, who is not having this sense of fulfillment inside? And can he put himself on this journey towards entrepreneurship? Oh my gosh, for sure. I mean, I want to, yeah, I, I, uh, you're so nice to say those words. And I will be the first person to say, my life is not perfect. I, there are things 
I have challenges that I, new ones and old ones, um, there are things that I'm always working on. And so I, look, I, uh, I wrote this, is that me? Good, I'm sorry. I wrote, um, I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal a few years back, and I actually talked about how I thought entrepreneurship was a practice as much as uh, my yoga practice. And I made that comparison, and I, I don't think that there's ever, um, you don't have to wait for anything to start attempting that practice. Maybe you're, you know, first time you do yoga, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't do anything, and five minutes in, you're, you're defeated, and you just try again the next day, and you can do some more poses and do it a little bit longer, and same thing. So wherever you are, whatever you're starting with, just practice at it. Um, this sounds too vague, but even, even in terms of if you start with uh, small experiments or then to test assumptions about something you want to maybe go build, or prototypes, like really quick, fast, easy um, builds of things that you want to create, like rough drafts, right? Test them, learn, iterate, keep building. Projects that have a start and finish. I'm not going to go start a full organization. I'm going to I'm going to do this for the next three months and learn this and this and this and then see where I am. So you can always make it sort of bite sized You can make it the, the, the scope and the size that you are ready to take on at the, this moment in your life. And it's the same thing with relationships, it's the same thing with any area. Start where you are, take the step that you can take, and then keep moving, keep working on it. And there's always gonna be, you know, it'll never be perfect. My life is not perfect, it's perfect for me, but it's not perfect, perfect. And there have been some I can go into the good, the bad, and the ugly if you'd like, but you know it's a slog. It's it's um it's it's you do the best with what you have every day. It's small achievement give you motivation. Yes, there's nothing like doing the thing itself to motivate you to do more of the thing itself. I um my my dear wonderful dad loves to read books, and he he would go crazy here, <laughs> especially he would love it. He loves to read books and find all these nuggets of inspiration and talk about ideas and I'm always, we always have this fun back and forth where I say, next week, don't read that book, go do this thing that you're excited about this week. Like, I, I have read fewer books and fewer books, I feel like, at least business type books um, over the years because I'm kind of addicted to the idea of just trying stuff. And as you try and by the way, it's not, not all gonna work and you'll fail and it'll be messy. I don't know if um, that, ever, that ever feels like a barrier for you, but. Just erase that language of failure, success or failure, to, you know, from your vocabulary, and think about it more as just a test. I'm testing these ideas. I think these are my predictions. Maybe it'll work the day, the way that I'm predicting, and maybe I'll learn something new. Great. This worked. This worked. This was a surprise. Okay, I'm gonna try again. Maybe next time, all three things turn out the way you thought they would. You get better and better at predicting. But it's not about, oh, I failed. It's okay. Well, you had a different assumption, and it, no big deal. Just keep. Iterating and moving on. Hi. Uh, Hi. Uh, I have a question for both of you. Uh, uh, the first question is that uh, we right now we're uh, looking at world pushing the youngsters a lot to come into the field of entrepreneurship, bring come up with ideas and start their own startups. Um, <coughs> but uh, we rarely see any youngster coming up with a social entrepreneurship. Uh, so, uh, what do you think that what's the right time uh, for being a social entrepreneur? Is it at the early stage or the ones who are more mature and experienced? Uh, or does that come uh, as naturally as the uh, entrepreneurship thing itself comes in anyone? The social, does the social yeah. entrepreneurship come in a similar way or do, can someone actually think about it and start something yeah. from the scratch at a young age? My second question is, it's with Naeem. Um, and you are in the, you, you are looking to start a culture of Pakistan very closely. Uh, what do you think, how far Pakistanis are uh, into uh, diving into the social entrepreneurship more rigorously as compared to the others? I can answer the first and then hand off to you. So I think in the future, maybe not that far off future, it won't be social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. It will be entrepreneurs and those who are thinking proactively about all the ways that their work and what they're building and the product or service that they're making, how that affects people and how it affects the environment, how it affects all these social issues, um, those are the ones who, who will win, period. And the ones who are not, who are just maybe plain old entrepreneurs, 
and are just making something without thinking about the big picture and thinking about the social impact of the thing that they're doing. Because by the way, everybody has a social impact. It's either positive or kind of middle of the road or negative. So social entrepreneurs are thinking about that proactively today. And I think that's fantastic and very forward looking. In the future, everybody's gonna have to answer for these things. It's just the way the world is moving. So everybody will be a social entrepreneur of sorts in the future because we'll all be called, we'll all be held responsible, I think, for how we are impacting those beyond the purchasers of the thing we provide, for example. I'll actually keep it short to your friend's point. <laughs> I'll stop there. There, good. <laughs> So, so the Pakistani ecosystem started to emerge. About five years ago, there were less than 100 startups coming out of Pakistan. In just five years, you have now more than 1,000. So the rate of growth is exponential. And what's dramatically changed is the access of it, the internet, right? Three years ago, we didn't have 3G and 4G. Now, in just three years, in terms of ease of reach, right now, we want 47 out of 190 countries. This is really bad. If you're an entrepreneur, it's hard to do business here. We're going to change it dramatically, right? Again, using technology, digitalize it. Then, once you make it easy, we are a talented country. You know, there's a word called Jugaru, right? Which is a Urdu word which means, you know, somebody who finds a way. Our culture, I that word, but I our culture is really around that. Because we, we've lived in very difficult times, we found ways to survive, right? The same energy when it's translated into solving real problems is very powerful. The other thing we need to do is change mindsets, right? We've got to have a sense of empowerment. Oh, you know what? Colonization did to us was disempowered us. We started believing that somebody else controlled our destiny. Even now, that's true for most people in Pakistan. And that's the one thing that needs to change. You, you've heard her speak. The sense of empowerment and belief that she brings is unbelievable. She believes in herself. She, she believes in her heart. And that is, and that's why we need role models like her. And thank you for being here and shining this way. Show that it's possible. Anyone and everyone can do it. We just gotta have this belief in ourselves. So I'm quite excited. I think you know we're gonna have a, you know many more Jessicas come out of Pakistan, right? We need we need more. We need more role models like this. Sure. Well, so what's exciting? We haven't really talked out specifically about disruption, but the fact that just that's just one example of this paradigm shift that's coming, right? As the internet is just exploding. And when you have disruption like that, when you have when you have a paradigm shift like that, new whole new things become true. Like I said, that weren't before. So um, a nod to my philosophy studies way back in the day. There's a, a philosopher, a, a science philosopher, Thomas Kuhn, and he's the guy that sort of coined the terms paradigm and um, anomaly. And so as things are changing so rapidly, start to look for anomalies. Start to look for things that you'll observe that are surprising to you, and that maybe weren't there a few weeks back, a few months back, that's where really fun, exciting, and disruptive opportunities will come. Because the whole world shifts when you have uh, these such fast, uh, sh fast changing um, uh, landscape like this. So that'll be fun. I will, I will be watching and cheering you all on. One last question. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you're a mom. And um, I have four kids of my own, and before you know, having all four of them, I was you know very academic, go-getter kind of person. People yeah. thought that you know I would end up at some you know international organization, you know, heading some company and whatever. Right now, I'm completely at home, taking care of my four kids, ranging from you know ten years of age to almost two. And Congratulations! Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um, the kind of world we live in, where we sort of um, value or um, attach um, significance of an individual to how much they're earning. Success is measured in terms of, you know, oh, he's a CEO, oh, you know, he's, you know, earning this much, and it's never really measured in soft terms. And I think, and it amazes me how working moms are able to find that balance. And I would like to know. Do you believe that moms can have have it all? Um, how has it been for you as a mother to balance, you know, being a mother and also, you know, lead such a yeah. huge organization? Well, let me be clear. So first of all, I, congratulations, and I, 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 at the first sort of um, 
totally surprising feeling that I had in the first year of my, uh, we, have, we have twins that are six and a three-year-old, all boys. And when the, after the twins were born, I thought, oh my gosh, I want to go high five all the moms in the whole world. This is amazing. I can't believe everybody does this. Not that, I can't believe we're all here because somebody did this for us. This is insane. So I'm um, high five. Um, to be clear, I don't run Kiva today. I, I haven't been there full time for quite a while. I left, I did another startup, I've done lots of other pieces. What I've found works for me really well, again, to pay me in the currencies that matter to me. I, am, I do not have the biggest paycheck, but I do feel very fortunate that I can um, you know, create some value and then get compensated to provide that value in pieces. So I have a portfolio approach right now to my work. I do some work. Some pay me, some I pay them, <laughs> like the nonprofits. Um, I teach, it is an amazing gig, and I teach like one class a year. It maybe covers my parking, but it, so it's about an equal thing, but I am so inspired by students. Anyway, I have these, I, I do some talks. Um, Reza and I are writing some things together lately, so I do a bunch of different pieces. And for me, it's harder, I think, and takes more energy to say, okay, what now, what now, what do I, what do I have on? the docket this week or this day while juggling my little beautiful wonderful kids that are that are my priority as they are yours um, in your life. I feel very fulfilled. I am not um, juggling a full time job and my kids and there are women that do that and I and I applaud them. For me, I know myself, I know what feels uh, fulfilling to me and what I'm good at. And so in some ways having these pieces and, and always sort of juggling a bunch of different balls as opposed to going to one job every day is harder, but that's what I've chosen for now. And I will keep doing it as long, God willing, keep doing it for a, a while because I really enjoy the variety. Um, so to answer the question, I think there are a lot of women who have a ton of choices and get a little bit paralyzed because they feel like they should be doing something, whatever that something is, if that something is a full-time job and being with your kids a million hours a week, or if it's you feel like you should be home, or you feel like you should be working and not home, whatever the combination is that sort of is nagging at you, I, I, I try to encourage women generally, but also, um, and, and my friends, and like cheerful one-on-ones, you know, to just, what what is your heart really telling you? What do you really want? There's no right answer. I do believe it's a limited time offer. Kids, right, like, you, they're not there forever, and so that, is a big deal for me, um, and, and for me that makes me want to spend an inordinate, an inordinate amount of time with them right now. So I do believe women can have whatever their all is. I think I have my all right now, um, and I'm so grateful that I have enough, uh, enough, I have enough options to, to make that happen, and it sounds like you are so talented and professionally you can be doing anything you'd like to do, and as a mom, you're you're there and you're present and you're loving it. And parenting metrics are tricky. What are they? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm sure you're doing great there too. Um, and so I would just encourage you and, and all of us as parents, not just women as moms, but as fathers as well, but as parents to really choose, um, be really creative with designing a life, designing your work and your family life together in, in conjunction in a way that allows you to feel true to yourself and like you are giving what you believe you, you want to give, you, 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 you desire to give in, in all those areas. I don't know if that answers it, but um, th I certainly don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer, for sure. And the last thing I would want to do is be prescriptive about, well, this is what anybody you know, should do as a parent. I, every family is different. Every parent is different. That's, that's where I am. Thank you for your presence and participating in this with, you know, it's, it's, it's such, I don't know, it's felt great energy in this room. So, any Thank closing you. words? And I'm just grateful. I, I will let everyone go on to their things. I'll be here for a little bit if you want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, but I am just so grateful to you, my friend, for the, you know, we, we, we talked, we could have covered a lot of um, different things today, and I'm so glad that we focused on what I think matters the most. So thank you for being willing to go there and, and as a group being willing to talk about those things. I appreciate it. Thank you.